Morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. morning. So I think you've I've introduced everybody by by email. So so um, we'll, we'll um, Maxim is the um, is come joined us from Ebury, Ed. Good stuff. And and Roger is our uh, international trade expert. Morning, Roger. Morning, Maxim. Um, I, I don't know if I missed instructions earlier, but uh, just in case I did, uh, my name's Edward Booth from uh, Bibby Financial Services. So I'm a business development manager. Um, been at Bibby for five years. Uh, got a bit of a specialism in terms of export finance and uh, also do trade finance as well. So um, obviously uh, very on topic for today's, today's subject, hence what I'm here. Good, good. Very interesting. Um, um, so I introduce myself. I'm Roger. Off you go, Roger. Uh, guys, guys, Jill's going to be all over the place at the moment. We've just got another person joining. If if we well, do, you can do the introductions. But if if once Dan, who's just coming in now, is in, if you can give it sort of as I say, ten second silence. Let Richard open up, and then he'll do the introductions. And then when it goes to the recording, it'll all be very straightforward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's my bad. I've done the gun there. No, no, that's okay. That's fine. So Richard, if you take control now, I'll go off screen. Yeah, OK. Right. We'll just give it a few couple more minutes then to see who uh, joins us. We typically, have, in the past, we've had people join, you know, five, 10 minutes in sometimes, but we won't wait that long. Right, we'll just give it a, another another minute or so. so um, Pete said there was a few more people in the waiting rooms. So. There's no one actually in the waiting room. If you want to go live, uh, okay. Well, we'll we may as well start then. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, I'm Richard Holling, and welcome to uh, Access for Finance for the uh, for International Trade. Um, this uh, this morning, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our panel, um, which is uh, Roger, Maxim, and, uh, and Ed. I'll um, I think uh, the the subject today is how to finance international trade, and we'll be taking various scenarios about uh, how the the uh, how that trade can be can be financed. So, but before we do that, let's uh, just introduce ourselves. So, I'm Richard Holling. Um, my background is actually international sales and account management, working for big IT companies. And uh, I pivoted a couple of years back to work for fintech companies, and now I'm a finance broker. Um, so Roger, what, could you like to introduce yourself? Well, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Roger McCrill. Um, I'm the founder and managing director of a company called Sabre UK Limited, situated here in uh, Morton in the Marsh in the Cotswolds. Uh, my background is associated with international business. Um, I've worked in India, China, the Americas, Germany, um, obviously the UK and uh, North America as well as the as Canada. Um, fundamentally running large, medium and small companies. Uh, the business we run now is helping companies locate particularly in India and China, either locate from the point of view of uh, setting up a supply chain out of India um, or China into the UK for product, or conversely the other way around, 
or setting up operations for joint ventures or partnerships or wholly owned operations within those territories. We've been doing that since 2007 and um, I'm looking forward to sharing some experiences with you and understanding how we can improve international financing. Okay, thank you Roger. Maxim? Morning all, um, I'm, my name is Maxim from Ebri. Um, been at Ebri for around five years. If you haven't heard of Ebri, we're a fintech that works in the foreign exchange, but also the trade finance and payments uh, industry. Um, I helped build the trade finance products at Ebri um, five years ago, and since then we've been developing new and, and adding new products into into the market. Um, I recently Santander purchased uh, fifty percent of us. Uh, for quite a substantial sum um, and uh, yeah looking to kind of grow that and improve our helping for for UK SMEs but also across uh, Europe so our focus has always been international trade um, and yeah hope I can add some insight and, and helps with you help you guys with some queries and and see what we can uh, thrash out online yeah, well, thank, thank you and Edward Good stuff. Thanks, Maxim. Thanks, Richard. Um, so morning, all. My name is Edward Booth. I work for Bibby Financial Services. So we're the UK's largest independent invoice finance provider. Um, we, we like to focus on SMEs, uh, of course, show that the heartbeat of the UK economy and putting in flexible funding solutions for these businesses. The focus for ourselves is mainly on invoice finance and also trade finance as well. And we've got a specialism within export finance that we really like to speak about. Um, I've been with Bibby for almost five years now. Uh, my remit as business development manager is to, to, to work with new businesses and put funding in place. Uh, I'm based in uh, the southeast, but Bibby have got a uh, whole, whole um, cover the whole UK in terms of their footprint. We've also got an international presence uh, with 32 offices across the world as well. And um, so really keen on export and, and helping put solutions in for businesses that are looking to expand internationally. Yeah, of course you've got the you're, you're a, a logistics company as well, aren't you, Bibi as a group? That's uh... yeah, Bibi as a group. There's a uh, probably less said on that the better at the moment because there've been a few sales going. I see Maxim la laughing there because it's been in the press recently. But the um, the Bibi organisation actually has been around since 1807, and we've still got um, fifth generation families at, at the head of it, Sir Michael Bibi, which is a it's a great selling point for ourselves. But there has been some ongoing changes in terms of the Bibby Line Group. We recently got rid of the, um, not got rid of, but sold the logistics arm. Uh, we also got rid of our retail arm, which was Postcutter, that uh, made a sale there. So, uh, yeah, all changing, but all, all good news for sure. Okay, great. Okay. So, um, the, the way I, I think uh, it would be good to, to run this is if we talk about, rather than that talk about you know, specific financial products, which can be hard to, for people to sometimes understand, is actually talk through a, a potential um, a scenario of a, which we can then sort of pin financial transactions and financial products off, uh, and then also um, the, the um, give uh, Roger an, uh, an opportunity to also talk about. Uh, yeah, how, how that, that can work and some of the pros and cons of, of, of some of these things in terms of the, the processing. So the first sort of scenario I, I have is sort of a UK um, trading company. So, but this is somebody who manufactures wholly overseas, probably using a contract manufacturer or white label manufacturer in India or China, um, and uh, but designs in the UK. And actually this is, you know, an example I had is when I was working for, for HP, I, I was flying in and out of China, uh, selling into China, but I, I took a flight and I actually sat next to somebody who was in the Kugler toy business. And uh, what they used to do was license designs from the US, then take those, those designs and, and enhance them and then get the products manufactured in, in China and then sell them to um, theme parks across Europe. Uh, it was the sort of Looney Tunes sort of uh, cartoon characters that they had the license for for, for Europe. So they were selling you know, predominantly to large, uh, not retail, well, you know, theme parks, which are, I guess are large retailers, 
um, and to a certain extent, they also did online sales. So, Roger, I think you have a, a similar example, you said, from somebody you know in, in, in India. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I've been dealing with a company um, quite some time. They, they, start, they, they go about a four, four to six million pound turnover. Um, when I met them, it was about four million. It's now running up, I think, about eight million. Um, they're an innovation company and relatively short of cash. Um, they do the design work in the UK, design and development. It's an, it's an engineering product, not a consumer product in the way that you've described. Um, the, I guess the first thing is convincing companies and SMEs in particular to look at international trade financing to support their view of moving overseas whether it be just to manufacture or to sell. Um, you have to be in it for the long haul. What sort of products are available to, to, to encourage companies to, to start that process? Do you want to, to start with that, uh, Maxim? If I walked, if I rang you up and, and introduced you to that client, what, what would your first uh, thoughts be? So I think, first of all, you want to understand the market that they're in in the UK. So understand... Um, how they are sourcing the products, um, really try to understand the supply chain um, as it stands. Um, now, if they are looking to start moving manufacturing over to, say, China, for example, um, you know, first thing, it's a daunting prospect, right? It's, it's difficult to, um, to try and manage yourself so first of all getting in touch with some experts to see you know if they have people in China to help manage that process and help with for example uh, the language barrier um, so you know having somebody that you can bounce ideas off and somebody who has a, a, a greater understanding of um, you know China and India is important from a from a management um, manufacturing perspective from a financing perspective um, you know Often when starting new relationships in, in these regions, you're going to be needing to pay deposits on you know, anything that you're, you're, uh, you're manufacturing. So from a cash flow perspective, that can obviously be the first hurdle and that can come with issues, um, with quality control and, and a huge amount of cash being outlaid at the beginning, which is impacting your, your cash flow for the, for the business. Um, so as a product, you would look at some form of um, funding which will allow you to pay deposit uh, pay deposits on your uh, purchases from China um, and you know those tend to be unsecured uh, because naturally there's you know once you place an, an order for something there's no actual tangible good that you have they have manufactured so you can't you know financiers can't take title over that so you know that would be my first bit of advice is to find a company that can actually pay deposits for you okay if i could just if i could just move on from there a little bit this company the scenario i'm suggesting um the company we actually have people on the ground for example in my company we have people on the ground in china and india uh, we train people in cultural understanding and language opportunities as well india speaks english but they don't speak english it's a very old english um, this company wanted to look at moving their production out of the UK. Um, and the first advice we gave them was, it's a long haul. You're talking about two years to set up your operation and get a return on it. Mm -hmm. um, how, what, what mechanisms or what instruments are available to support them at that first stage? Okay, well, I think I might yeah, answer, answer that. I think, you know, so... In terms of um, you know, funding, that, I mean, there are a number of lenders that would just look. At, they would look at the UK operation and what the what they were trying to actually achieve. And if the if the underlying business business is profitable in in the existing state, um, that yeah, then there are you know, lots of lenders that would look at you know funding that that initial unsec unsecured uh, piece. Or if the if the business has got you know assets in the UK that can be used to sec secure lending, and obviously that that's uh, that's something people would look at either premises or or existing stock or, or existing relationships. Um, 
and I think you know also there's there's other products that that you might have Ed, you know in terms of helping with with immediate cash flow issues and injection of cash. You know, yeah, I think uh, yeah, just just to jump in there, I think the, the question that Rogers asked is not something that we as a lender, I presume uh, Maxim as well, probably would look to fund uh, straight up the back because that's a pretty risky uh, risky proposition to ask money for because. The key thing for ourselves as a lender, and this is the first question I'd ask of the prospect or, or the client, however you want to describe them, is you know what, what are the risks involved? If we're to give you the money for these purposes you're asking for, you know, where potentially could we lose the money, lose our money, or could you lose your money? Now, that's where, Roger, I'm sure you add a lot of value to the business because if uh, the business is looking to relocate their production out to India or the, or the Far East, there's a lot of risk involved. Uh, it's a long-term investment and we need to make sure we can fully understand the, the potential implications there. So I'd probably look at, say, you need to understand what cash you do need in order to facilitate that investment and ways to raise that. I don't think there's necessarily a product, Richard, you may be know best than myself, that would be strictly for the relocation of manufacturing out of the UK. Um, would you say that's, that's fair to say, Richard and Maxim? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it's not so much a trade finance sort of funding there. It's it's more of looking at the core business in the UK and whether or not they're credit worthy you know, with their existing business and then giving them them cash. It, it would be the same criteria as if they were just relocating from, from London to Glasgow or if they were looking to add um a second product line to their manufacturing capability in the uk with asset you know with um so um it's it's yeah so that's the that's the approach i would i would take and then obviously you know you'd work with a company to give you forward cash uh cash forecasts and planning so you know what the as well you know as the, the forward looking plan would be in the two year in two years time and that would probably show enhanced margins and, and, and enhanced capability. And that would just give more confidence to the lender. But the lending would be based on the, on the existing business and the existing, uh, existing um, yeah, cash, cash flow. I mean, the only other thing I could think of is, yeah, so that would be unsecured. It might be a potential for using something like invoice finance or factoring to, to, uh, to help. With, with immediate cash flow issues you know, over that period as well during the transition. But that's very much then based still on the UK business. It's not, you're not lending to the new Indian entity or Chinese entity. You're, you're, you're lending very much to the UK entity. Yeah, I think, I think you really, we need to look at this as a short-term and long-term issue, right? So if this is a, uh, a long-term investment, they are going to be moving over to, say, China, then you need to be thinking, right, we need to raise funds to A, build a factory, or B, to rent premises, or, or you know, C, to have a workforce, or maybe we will just white label this manufacturer through another entity in China. You know? So in the long term, you, your options would be to raise capital, you know, sell part of the company or sell, share, share, sell shares in the company. Often they don't want to, or companies will not want to dilute their ownership. Totally understandable. Um, you know, probably if you have property in the UK, you know, using that as security in order to release funds is usually your best option. Um, then once you have that with say a two, three, four year plan and, um, expected go live date and manufacture date and increase in uh, margin by five ten percent then at that point <clears throat> if you wanted to say pay back your your loans etc you could use short-term funding on the front end or the invoice discounting on the back end in order to you know free up cash and use your cash maybe where it would generate money better or generate you know, uh, uh, returns better. So it's, it's, there's never, all, uh, you know, a one size fits all. Uh, usually and often you have to use multiple products in tandem, um, maximizing or, or minimizing costs, right? Um, yeah. Bill, Roger, you'll agree. Well, well the, the outcome was that we, we found them a partner to, to set up the manufacturing and the partner set up the manufacturing with very minimal cost to the UK company. Um, and within, I think it was about nine months, the, the operation was up and running, the product certified, and 
started to come back into the UK. Um, I say long haul financing because then you have to build up the production to, to a volume that is sustainable. Um, so we've reached the stage where we've now got production running um, and manufacturing is underway with a partner. So the risk that was generated was minimal. Um, funding was still very tight because again, it's a long haul situation. You're, you're starting to put funds in now into work in progress and inventory um, in boats and so forth. So what sort of mechanism then do we have once we're starting to manufacture uh, that could assist this company in, in A, financing um, the, the goods in transit because we've got a four week transit time from India. So those goods, which are roughly at about two, roughly at about a thousand pound a piece, you've got a, you've got a container with 60 of them in. So you're talking around 60,000 pound per container coming in. So what, what sort of financing could be offered to that company to, to again, support their cash flow for the goods coming in to the UK, first of all, and minimizing the risk of obviously any, any losses. So you're well, just, to, uh, just to clarify, um, are we assuming the, uh, the, the, the new uh, production unit is set up as a separate entity or is it essentially uh, part of the UK business? No, it's a, se it's a separate entity. It, it's, contra it's contract manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Maxim, I don't know if you want to jump in, but uh, Bibi's got a, a couple of solutions we could potentially explore in, in a situation like that. Um, I won't steal all, all of Maxim's um, thunder on the trade finance piece, but Bibi as a, as a trade finance provider have got what we call a type one or a type two facility. So on the base of a type one facility, what that is is funding a uh, confirmed purchase order from their, their customers in the UK. So if we speak to the UK operations team, they've got purchase orders from their, their, their debtors or their customers to say, I'd like, for example, four containers so the value of that order would be in, in the region of 240,000. Off the back of the, the strength of that purchase order, we would facilitate the payment to the contract ma manufacturer in order to um, save any any challenges in, in finding that cash. Because no doubt there's a, a, a lag between the, the goods being produced, the goods being delivered, obviously they've got to sit on the water and then subsequently being delivered to their end user which will then be followed by a, a payment term for that invoice. So the key thing there is all about understanding the transaction cycle and where we need to pay the suppliers and then repay the facility potentially with an invoice finance facility on, on the other side as well. So funding the front end and the back end of the transaction. Well, the, Maxim, the, is that similar what, to, to what you guys would well, like to explore? Just to give you a bit more information, the initial terms of the agreement was to um, pay on dispatch at CIF um, okay. arrangement. Uh, ultimately, it's come to every second or every third container is paid uh, CIF. The others are paid on receipt into UK port. So th there's quite a, a difference in financing needs now compared to where we started. So what, again, what sort of financing might be available under those sort of conditions? So yeah, I, I agree with, with Ed on that one, definitely. Um, understand that the trade cycle is important. Um, no deposits, which is obviously a positive, um, which would, would basically brings down your, your pay lag to around your four week transit uh, for some of them and slightly less if, they're, um, if you're paying on receipts. So the way that I would look at it you have to ask other questions as well. You have to wonder, what is the product? Is the product something that will initially hit the shelves and then fly straight off? Is it a product where you now need to remanufacture or add some additional products to this in order to be able to sell it? Is there a lag in the middle of the cycle where we are now manufacturing or continuing with that? Um, and then you have to wonder, is this a business to business company or is this a business to consumer company? So if there's a business to business um, angle and you're offering 60 or 90 days to your customers as well, you've now got you know, two options. You could look at financing um, with the supplier on the current pay terms from the supplier side. 
Um, so, for example, Ebri would uh, look to either have one or two options, speak to the supplier in India and say to them, look, you know, I understand cash flow is a little bit tight at the moment across the globe and uh, cash is kin. <laughs> you know, if we were to pay you on invoice date, would there be a potential discount in the, on the, in the order price? Uh, and often, you know, there, there is a discount. So if we can do that, then we would pay the invoice on day one. You would then have, you know, up to 150 days to pay that back. You know, so that would be option one. Another option would be, right, let's, let's stick with the payment terms that we already have uh, and just invoice them the moment or pay the invoice the moment that we need to pay the invoice to, to India. And that would then extend your credit terms by 150 days. Um, so that would be uh, an option. Um, and then alternatively, you know, uh, depending on your customer, if it, if it is a business to business customer, we could then set up an invoice discounting facility, which would allow you to receive funds as soon as you raise your invoice from your customer 120 days uh, um, early or 90 days or whatever the payment terms are. So you're using both ends of the cycle really to free up cash um, to invest in more goods or, you know, spend. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a business to business um, relationship. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's what I, that's what I would, um, would, would look at through. And I mean, there are other products as well. If this was a large, um, if you had very, very large customers, then you could look at purchase order financing. Um, but, you know, all of this is unsecured, which given the climate is, is quite useful because it could actually run alongside any banking arrangement that you have. You know, the banks will take title over goods. You know, we wouldn't. Um, yeah, it's an option. It's always worth having options. Okay. Um, just to add a complication as time went on, I think what you've suggested there is 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 very very encouraging actually, um, as a, as the tools to support such an operation. But then then we moved on to supplying from India um, against purchase orders received in the UK to the US and to Australia and to Singapore, um, and there was a high seas trade high seas change in invoicing. Um, do you support that in any financing way at all? Uh, if I could jump in there, Roger. Uh, so you're invoicing from the UK and C to uh, the USA and Australia, so that the invoice would be payable to the UK entity. Um, in terms of a funding aspect there, we, Bibi, as, a, as an invoice financier, uh, have a specialist export office, office which is focusing on business that invoicing outside of the UK. So we can raise cash on the invoices outstanding from the Australian and, and US companies. So at, at the point of delivery, if they're raising invoice on 36 day payment terms, we can release potentially up to 85 to 90% of the value of that invoice on the day it's been delivered. A um, couple of key considerations here, guys, in terms of what, what we look at as a lender. Uh, jurisdiction is really important for ourselves. So if we're considering, in, in a worst case scenario, if there's any sort of dispute, um, which court of law we'll be working in, preferably be, always be the UK, that'd be ideal for ourselves, but not all courts are, are made equal. Obviously, you've touched upon the USA and Australia, pretty much well suited for ourselves, but it does get a bit more trickier if you're moving into, say, the Middle East, you know, Saudi Arabia, UAE, which you can see, if you're looking at debt that's jur jurisdiction falls under these entities, it can be a bit trickier to fund because what we have to look at is if we need to take these debts to court, are we going to get our money back? And inevitably, it's more challenging recovering money for the Saudi courts than it is for the USA courts for reasons that I won't go into detail today. Mm -hmm. um, so jurisdiction mm -hmm. key thing for ourselves. Obviously, the contracts that are in place, uh, what are the terms of the sale? Are there any rebates? Are there any returns? Have they got any warranties? All of these things are going to be key for us to reviewing as to whether we think we can fund that receivables debt to these international customers. And then finally, looking at the credit limit of the customers goes without saying. And Roger, no doubt you speak to your clients and so do you, Maxim. Um, if you're going to offer 60-day, 90-day payment terms, are you offering it to customers who are actually credit worthy? 
So it may well be all in good so they can get a hundred thousand order from a, a company in the USA, but if they're only recently been set up and they've got no sort of limit on credit safe, or if you can't get a what we call bad debt protection or credit insurance limit, which we, we can touch upon further, you shouldn't be giving credit limits to these customers, and we necessarily won't be happy to fund them either. So again, that that's a key thing for, for you to consider if you are going to start looking at exporting internationally. Okay. Okay, um, then of course there is the selling out of the UK to both um, UK and EU customers. Um, now that the company sells directly to the US, um, to a company over there and into Australia and Singapore, they tend to keep their sales out of the UK relative to, as I say, the EU and um, the UK only. Um, again, presumably invoice financing is an opportunity here, is it? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, Richard, did you want to add anything? Obviously, you know quite a lot about the different providers of, of invoice finance in the market. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, obviously, the, there are a number of you know, people that would look at in, invoice finance uh, once the invoice is issued. I think <laughs> that, but the, I think, I guess my my question around this is that that invoice finance will only be financed when the invoice is issued, which typically for your customers won't be until the goods have been received and, uh, or, or of, 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 of landed. So, you know, the, the, the question I guess then is, you know, what's actually funding the, the goods that have been, you know, if the supplier, the manufacturer, you said, wants the payment when the goods are put on board ship in India um, for every other container, I think you said, you know, what happens there? I mean, so that at that point, we still, I think, we're still relying on trade, fi uh, one of the trade finance products, to to actually fund them at that point, and that's unless I've missed something, Maxim and, and Edward, that Ed, that Edward, that's that's all on the basis of a secured purchase order um, with a credit worthy custo uh, customer. I guess I would throw a spanner in the works and say, what if that's for stock? Um, as opposed to yeah, that's, uh, a, that's a really good question, um, and that's what we call the. Uh, that's um, for ourselves. We have what's called a Type Two transaction, uh, which essentially is purchasing for stock. And a key thing for ourselves, which Maxim touched upon, is again goes back to our exit strategy. So what we want to be doing is purchasing uh, goods that we know we can recover our money from. So very specialised goods. Say if they've got, um, you know, they're customised for the customer, or they're only suitable for a very niche area of, of industry. We probably wouldn't look to purchase them on. Uh, type to stock basis and the reason because the, because of that the way we look to recover our money in a gone situation is, is reselling the goods and recovering our money that way if there's only a very small number of customers in the world or in the uk who would be interested in purchasing those products it doesn't give us a strong market to, to resell those products and recover our situation our position from um also, on a type two transaction, we're going to want to look at you know, a decent balance sheet in terms of the financial worth of the business. So we are going to look closer at the financials of the business we're looking to fund, um, rather than looking as closer on the transaction cycle, because we have to have confidence in the business is going to keep trading through and they can sell these goods through. So it's all about looking at the stock cycle as well, how quickly that stock turns in a type two stock purchase situation. Maxim, does that um, is that stack up with similarly with what you guys look to offer? Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly the same. Um, yeah, I mean you're bang on. I think we it comes down to the credit worthiness of of the customer, but then like you say, you have to look at the trade cycle, repayment cycles. You'll look into you'll be running um, algorithms to see how quickly it could be repaid if not. And yeah, agreed. You know, the the goods are important as well. What they are. Saying. Um, so yeah. Hmm. And what what sort of what sort of costs are involved for the for the services we've been discussing, uh, both the trade financing and invoice financing? What what are the sort of normal levels that a company might expect? Uh, so that's dependent on, on on a few things for for ourselves. So size of the transaction, risk involved, security. So there's all these different elements to take into account. When you talk about fees, you know, no trade finance facility is one size fits all. So we have to look at all the different parameters of the business and how we're going to look to support them to really give a, 
a true reflection of what the cost is going to be. But uh, the politicians answer for yourself, Roger. But inevitably, we do have a way in, in which we structure the fees, and typically, we'll charge a percentage on the trade um, on the trade for the days that the trade is out outstanding. So maybe a typical example would be to charge two percent of the value of the trade per thirty days that the the trade is outstanding. And then similarly to that, on the invoice finance fees, there's two main fees associated with the facility. It's a service fee, which is the cost of the facility, um, which is a fixed percentage applied to every invoice that you have uh, assigned to the facility. And then additionally, there's a discount fee, which is a cost of funds. That's an annual rate of interest that we calculate daily, depending on how long your, your invoice are outstanding and what your utilisation on the facility is. So yeah, just to reiterate, so trade mm -hmm. is charged on a per 30, per 15, per 45 day transaction cycle. And then additionally on the service, on the invoice finance, which we would use to repay the trade would be a, a service fee and a discount fee of the two main costs associated. Mm. Okay. Maxim, is that similar to the way that you guys would structure it potentially? Um, so ours is slightly different if I focus on the trade finance front end side. Yeah. So what we've tried to do is um, we've, remo we've removed the setup fee, we've removed the fee per invoice, the monthly usage fee. So we, we've tried to, it's, it's free to set up and it's free to maintain. So it kind of sits as almost like a, an overdraft facility. So you could have, let's just say, half a million pounds there sitting if you needed it. Um, and then you only actually pay once you upload an invoice. Um, so you would have a credit limit of say 500K. Um, and then when you upload an invoice, you would pay on a daily pro rata base. So if you pay back after 30 days, you'd only pay for 30 days usage all the way up to 150 days. Um, but I agree with you there, Edward, as well. It's not, there's no, the prices, it's not like the banks where it will just be very, you know, one fixed price, give or take a percent here or there. Um, we look at the risk profile of the business um, and I mean, I sit in on these treasury meetings, they go into some detail that is well above my, my understanding, um, but they will look at repayments um, cycles, they will look at, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy, it's, it's, they, they really delve deep and, and in fact, they're, you know, as a business, you know, we, we have quite a, a strict risk appetite because we, we're not we tend to look at businesses that are growing. That's what we like to look for. We're not here as a, you know, rescue company. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, we, it could, I don't want to talk figures because you always anchor, but I've got guys that are, that are on 0.15% per month, but then I've got guys at 1.2% per month, you know, which is a broad range, but it kind of makes you understand that, you know, we can help, um, but the cost is going to be, reflective of the risk profile of the business uh, because the problem the thing is it's unsecured so we take no title over goods at all so you know for an unsecured lender there's going to be uh, you know it's going to be a, often slightly more expensive but it does mean that you could have that alongside other secured financing um invoice discounting as we mentioned ed i'm not going to go into it too much because it's kind of similar to, to how you run things as well um so yeah I mean that. I mean that's not much different from the approach that you know any of the lenders in the in the main UK for secured for unsecured lending would take. I mean, the, it, it is all about you know the ability to repay and and the the um, the track record of the company and and the confidence people have in them, them as an operation and the sector. And also, I, I'd probably say that um, I mean I'm not f very familiar with trade finance, but I could imagine it's very similar to. To, to mainstream lending in that people specialize in certain industries as well and, and they get more get more um, sort of comfortable with things if you've if you've worked with existing customers in that sector where you know that you can you either can, can salvage the value of the goods or, or, or you have confidence because you see the sector you know grow it growing um, the other thing that uh, I find particularly with smaller SMEs uh, but even you know um, or, or even you know um, medium-sized ones, you know, turning over 10, 20 million pounds, is that people have to remember this is business lending. This is not 
consumer lending. So, you know, headline rates of 4% for your mortgage or, you know, 2 and 3% for a personal li- uh, loan, um, you know, that's, you just can't compare it. It's, that's like, you know, apples and pears in terms of, uh, or, or, or whatever the expression might be, uh, in terms of the type of, of lending. Um, so, um, you know, the, the rates are, are, are very different from consumer lending, which is, you know, at the moment, you know, it's a lot of very cheap for me around. Mm. Mm. So. Okay, so, um, right, well, um, I'm trying to think what else there, there is. So one of the things that, uh, you know, is, uh, what happens if if the goods, are, you know, when they, We've, we've here we've talked about situations where obviously there's a long term plan. The company's you know, been manufacturing, been trading, has found then a you know a, a good partner, Roger, that you've helped them with. They've done all the right thing in setting up a quality team and a you know, team to manage the, that white label supplier in in the the foreign the foreign country to to make sure there's no glitches during uh, production and it, you know. I guess there's there's random inspections of products as it comes off the production line, just to make sure the quality is there. What in the situation where this is more speculative? So that this in the last 12 months, we've had a lot of people suddenly being importing PPE, sanitizer, you know, gowns, God knows what from God knows where. Um, What's been the experience? Um, Edward and, and Maxim with that's those sort of businesses. How how do you treat those? If you know, say I was a yeah, you know, I've been a business that I've been I've been importing toys for the last five years out of China, and then uh, my Chinese contact says, oh, by the way, I've got another factory, and in that factory I make surgical masks and gowns. Um, do you want any? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Maxim, do you, do you want to go first? Because I, I could probably talk for the next two hours on a. The state of some of the inquiries we had over the um, over the, the more more you know, the worst period, but um, Maxim, do you want to go? Yeah, first? Me, me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody becomes a PPE expert overnight, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so we realised that this was quite an interesting period, so we actually launched a product to to, to target it, purchase order financing. Um, which worked well because what we found was there were a lot of businesses in the UK that were suddenly winning contracts well at, well out the realm of, of what they were, you know, from a balance sheet perspective, capable of financing. Um, but the government made their decisions on who to give those contracts to, whether they were correct or whether they weren't. You know, everyone deserves an opportunity as long as they as long as long as they are going to make sure they focus on quality and they provide what they need to so you know we weren't in a position to be picky it was just a matter of focusing on um focusing on uh, on helping them so initially when this first corona or covid crisis kicked off we have a lot of we've got um offices in hong kong and and, uh, in china they had the ppe issues first so what we were doing is we were actually linking chinese our chinese companies just general businesses in in China who needed PPE with UK suppliers of PPE. So we were just (laughs) two people together and saying, guys, look, help each other out. You know, not taking any money from it, but just helping people out. Then as the the crisis flipped to the UK, we then were like, okay, well, we have these contacts. So we set up a whole new arm of of sources of PPE and started doing things the other way. Um, But... What we tried to do um, was to find a product which would work for businesses um, that you know allowed them to fulfill these contracts and bid for bigger contracts. And you know, because it's it was a, a real money maker, you know, taking the, the health aspect out of this for, for businesses out there, it was an opportunity to quadruple their turnover in a year. So what we did is we set a product where we had to be very, very, very strict about having a previous relationship with a supplier of PPE. We weren't looking for businesses that were suddenly jumping into the PPE market who had no experience, had no contacts. We were looking for businesses that had suddenly needed to grow, had the contacts, had the quality controls, had the testing certificates, who had won contracts with, say, BMW, Amazon, or large blue chip businesses, or the NHS in the UK. 
So what we were then doing was for having contracts with the NHS where there was six months worth of say N95 masks at a million pounds a month and funding that for a six month period. Um, so that's what we would do. Uh, and it really helped because it, I mean, this wasn't unsecured, this would suddenly, it would be secured, we would have to. Um, mm -hmm. But it just opened up avenues for so many businesses to suddenly grow and bid on all of these, uh, on all of these kind of tenders. And yeah, it worked out quite well, but it wasn't easy, mainly because there was, you know, these deals would fall at, at so many hurdles and everybody was bidding and everybody wanted a slice of the action. So it was just competitive, you know, competitive. And, uh, and then there were fake masks and Edward, you'll know, it was, it was mayhem. It was like the wild west, right? Yeah. Um, I think it sounds back to me. You had a slightly better uh, experience than myself, but certainly uh, it kind of gave you an insight to, to some people's strategy of, um, Let's make as much money as possible out, out of what was a, a terrible and still is a terrible situation. Um, and I think, you know, when you start to break it down in terms of their transaction cycle, it was all a bit, you know, airy fairy in terms of the actual detail and who's going to be supplying it. And, and the easiest way that I would you know, get them to really understand, you know, the implications of what they're asking, you know, say they're asking us to fund two million pounds worth of PPE. The margin is going to be around 30%. I think Richard touched upon a really good question of what happens, what could go wrong. And if we look at the example of the UK government purchasing stuff themselves from Turkey, which turned out to be not fit for purpose, and, you know, touch wood, you like to think the government have got some sort of checks and balances in place as to what they're purchasing, but inevitably this transaction didn't turn out right. You know, what's to say that uh, a newly set up company who's managed to find some supplier in, in Korea or Turkey is going to have a better overview of, of the goods that they're purchasing than the UK government? And what would happen for ourselves as a lender if we put £2 million out the door to fund these goods and they come through and they're not fit for purpose whatsoever? And that's really, you know, seeing successful transactions, you know, doing your due diligence on your suppliers. If you, if you don't come to me as a lender with, with that information to hand from the off, I'd pretty much tell them to go away and, and kind of do a bit more homework and maybe come back when they've actually got a proper proposal for me. And that seems a bit mean, but it's a reflection of some of the um, inquiries we did have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I had one myself. Roger, did, Roger, did you see myself. any similar similar items as that? We, 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 had, we had many, many companies in India and China approach us. Uh, could we could we put them in touch with the government purchasing organisation to bring in the goods? Our first question was was, was do the goods meet the Euro European and UK standards? Uh, send us your certificates. That cut down the list probably by over fifty percent straight away. Um, we then sent somebody in because we had people on the ground both in India and China, and we then sent somebody in to have a look at the product. Uh, somebody in the, in the garment market and um, we did some local testing and I, I guess that brought the list down yet again by another 50%. Um, and then we approached with two, only I think there's only two companies we approached the government um, to look at the situation. Um, you, you do have to be very careful, you're absolutely right, relative to due diligence. So we do that first of all with any client we deal with overseas. Um, with the people on the ground. We look very carefully at them to make sure financially, quality-wise and ethically-wise, they are uh, something we want to deal with. And were you able to actually secure any contracts or, or, or not? Did you? Did it, or... No. I think the government by that time had, had laid down the contracts, uh, good or bad, and um, they said they would come back to us and they would approach these companies. Uh, we don't believe they approach them. Um, their, their, their criteria for selection seem to be very um, convoluted. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I once bid for a contract with the NHS, oh, I don't know, four or five years ago. It wasn't anything in this area. It was an IT system, but you know, uh, opaque is the best word to, to describe it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I mean, they, I, I always joke that the reason why we have uh, so many stringent controls in for government pur 
uh, government um, purchases is not because it's uh, it's clean. It's because it is so corrupt. I mean, if we did, if it was if it was clean, then we wouldn't need the processes. Right. Just as simple as that. But anyway, that's that's my jaundiced view of how, how, how have companies got on. I wonder, just to ask the question, there are still containers sitting on the docks with PPE in, along with about a million other containers containing everything else, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that that uh, perhaps brings up a slightly different. I'm going to take this off a different tangent because I've got, I've got um, somebody I know who's actually you know a, a, an analyst in the maritime industry. Does a lot of stuff around smart ports and stuff like that. But his background was actually as a communications officer in uh, in sort of merchant shipping. And very early on, there were a lot of ships that were just they weren't being allowed to dock. I mean, the, the what made it into the press was that yeah you know, the crews weren't being let off, and I think. At one point, there were crews on ships that had been over, you know, on their ships past, well, past, you know, three, six, uh, three or six months or even longer than their contracts were, were, due, were due. What happens, I mean, what happened with the goods that were sort of due in port and then for various reasons, ships weren't allowed to either dock to receive the goods or, or weren't allowed, you know, weren't, well, I guess putting them on ship, it's not an issue because nothing's been financed at that point. But, you know, when they're halfway across the Atlantic, and then you know they're told they're not allowed to dock. What what happens then? Well, we have that situation here uh, in that um, first of all the prices have gone up by a factor of three on maritime shipping. Um, what cost around about fifteen hundred dollars to ship a container to the U.S. now costs twenty foot container now costs nine thousand dollars. But we had ships arriving um, at Felix though. And being told they could not dock, they were sent off to Amsterdam or Rotterdam. Um, and it, coming back to the financing, of course, that delayed the containers sitting around for not a month, but some of them were for two months and some of them for ten weeks. Hmm. So that really that really interrupted the cash flow and the problems that um, were generated by two of our clients. Yeah. So, I mean, so Edward and Maxim, what do you do there? You just charge them an extra month's fee and you just keep a close eye on it? Or does that suddenly, have, you know, massive alarm bells and, and you're looking to have to take um, other remedies? It's different, isn't it? This year is slightly different to normal times. Um, delays, unfortunately, have to be paid for. They're not, there's something out of our control. Um, if they're at the higher limits of their credit limit, then, you know, potentially we could look to increase that credit limit to pay for, you know, another invoice, mm -hmm. um, which would free up the funds, knowing that they will eventually receive the funds. Um, but there's not a huge amount that we can do. Um, I mean, we can fund shipping costs, um, which is useful. We're finding that's got a lot of traction at the moment, because like you say, a lot of companies aren't shipping at the moment just because of the cost if you've got low value goods in there suddenly you know you're doubling tripling the cost of the goods themselves high value is slightly different but um yeah with chinese new year as well <laughs> it's it's mayhem um but there's not a huge amount you can do or we can do mm. barring increased credit limits and, and and help on that side so it sounds like and i guess you're going to say a similar thing edward but Sounds like if the customer's up front with you and tells you what's happened and keeps you, you know, informed of the situation and it all, yeah, if you like, smells right, then then you'll you'll work with the customer to resolve it because you you know you see you see the short term glitch. Yeah, yeah um, totally agree with you, your comments there, Richard and Ebsby. We uh, we like working with business, working internationally, but in terms of the support we can provide. Uh, we can't force the boats to come in, unfortunately, you know, is the sure of it. So as long as we can keep the, keep the support to keep the, if we have to keep the transaction open for longer in order to facilitate the, 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 the next end, that's the best thing to do. You know, we'd rather support the business for a bit longer in order to, to keep it ticking along rather than putting the support and, you know, further crystallising the challenges they're having. Uh, and I think that's the key thing there is what you said. If the business comes to the table, or the, the directors, however you want to word it, and says these are the challenges they're facing, then we can work together to, to create a solution. But if they go to ground, and we don't hear hear from them. The first we hear is when it's really gone wrong. I think that's where we, we face a bigger challenge ultimately. So, yeah, that, that support and that buy-in from the directors is the key thing for ourselves. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it, uh, I mean I, 
I've got less experience in, in, the, in sort of the ongoing, but certainly when I'm talking to clients that I'm bringing on board and finding a lender, I basically tell them, you know, tell me where all your skeletons are now before we even start the discussion with the lender. Because if they find a skeleton halfway through the, 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 the underwriting process, then that's going to, they, they may have accepted it if they don't own it up front. If they find a skeleton halfway through that underwriting process, then you're out the door. So, um, yeah, I think that's yeah. you know, being up front is, it, you know, you can work with people that are honest, uh, who have made honest mistakes. Um, but what you can't do is work with people who, uh, who, who hide them. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna, I think we've, I'm not sure if we've, we've lost the audience, but we are recording this and I'm going to, I'm, I'm very keen to sort of break it up later and then use this for, for, for ongoing, um, you know, education of potential customers. So what, but just what's happened, uh, this is a question more for Roger and I guess knock on to your businesses, uh, Edward and Maxim is air freight used to be all in the bottom of, you know, uh, passenger jets coming to and from Thailand or God knows where. And, you know, flowers coming from, from Kenya based on people going over there for their, their safaris. I mean, that's all stopped. I mean, what's happened to air freight? You, you, we, it's, it's it's um, very limited. Uh, a lot of airlines and Virgin and, for example, have created a lot more freighters in their fleets. Um, there was a package going out from here to one of our customers in uh, our clients in in India. It was registered on four different aircraft before it actually left, and it was actually uh, nearly two weeks late in leaving because it couldn't get onto the flight. Again, they're just very restricted in what's what's being allowed, or the flights available, uh, and that's in both directions. Flights out of India and China are very, very limited. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so, it, it's, but they're com that's interesting. They've come, they've sort of like ripped out the seats and they're putting in you know cargo type. On on, on so, yeah, some of the airlines, uh, but there are still passenger flights. One of the comments we had from uh, the airline that the consignment was booked in. Was that they had too much passenger luggage and they couldn't put in the um, the cargo, oh. which, which was a bit surprising to say the least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I wouldn't have uh, 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 thought that. Yeah. So, I mean, has that had a knock-on effect with with you guys, or, or you, you've seen a? I mean, or is or is the level of trade still on? You know, more or less what you'd expect. Or... Pretty much, it's still still been there. Um, with sea bills, obviously, trades continued and, and bumped back up. So um, there are more people using air freight, but yeah, we haven't seen a huge effect. Okay. That's interesting because... No, it's similar to us. Hmm. Right. Okay. That's right. Um, yeah, Maxim, uh, similar to ourselves, uh, and that's one of the questions we ask at pr prospective clients we work with is, we don't want to have them overly reliant on one source of transportation or freight logistics, similar to we don't want them overly reliant on one supplier, because you need to ask the question, you know, what happens if, if you can no longer work with that partner? So it's all about having an alternative um, solution there. So that, that form parts our due diligence, and hopefully the, um, the business has already looked to those options as well. Yeah, okay. Right, well, that's, um, I'm going to ask one more, sorry. No, I just wanted to add something briefly that's maybe slightly off topic, but not. I mean, have you guys, Roger, specifically found that customers mainly dealing in China have, have been receiving quite large price increases recently? <laughs> uh, I'm just going through that with the two clients at the moment. Um, the answer to your question is yes. Um, there is quite a significant level of price increasing coming through. Uh, first of all, on freight generated by obviously the, the cost of container shipping and uh, air freight increases. But there's also been a significant shortage of um, certain commodities in the, in the areas of copper. Copper wire has gone up dramatically uh, and copper tubing. The um, plastics have gone up. So yes, quite, quite a lot of increases coming through. Okay, uh, interesting. Just just noting, there's we, we've had a, a crazy number of, of our customers that are or clients that are buying from China who found that, and we've we kind of getting to the bottom of why, and we found some quite neat ways of of countering that. So maybe it's worth something we can take offline. But if there's something 
there are we've managed to get price decreases through do through uh, through a couple of neat tricks. So it might be worth us speaking afterwards. Um, Interesting that. that because uh, again we, we found it on copper. We, we we were able to push that one down in China. But yes, let's have a talk offline. That would be very interesting. Perfect. I think everybody's got each other's email addresses. I sent sent the form again with the revised emails. Ed, you've got Edward, you've got those as well. Yeah, no, I'll, yeah, I'll correct. Make, make, make sure that because uh, you've got those. So, that, that, so we've. What about the effect of Brexit? Is that had any? I mean, I, we hear about good standard in. I mean, I was talking to somebody just the other day who's got problems getting supply of stuff in out of Belgium at the moment. Um, but I mean, is is everybody's attitude? My attitude to that seems to be that it's all short term and in three months time, you know, the people will understand what what the right paperwork is and what they should be charging. But is that everybody else's view? I think I think some people are sitting still for a couple of months just to see where things were settled. Because obviously if you have to trade, of course people are. But I think some businesses were typically maybe doing a little bit more on the continent or from the continent in terms of importing. And maybe just waiting to see how things settle down because at the moment it's very fresh in everyone's mind and everyone's getting to use the, the new processes. Is I think um, there is an element of people, you know, standing still for the moment just to see um, what transpires and if any, any any changes or any improvement in processes does occur naturally uh, over that time. Yeah, okay. I, I think that's true. I think people are standing still. I also think there's there's quite a lack of attention being paid to the changes that are necessary. Um, I don't know if you're finding it, but there's a lot of documentation being um, incorrect, a, a lot of um, product being held at various ports. Um, but I think we haven't seen half of it yet, um, because as you say, this particular time, I think people are standing still. Um, the volumes are not there. Um, I think we've probably got another tsunami to come probably in February. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll 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 see. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've also heard. I think it was on your meeting yesterday, but you know, people say they're not they don't longer interested in in the UK as a customer. I mean, if if, if I guess if a factory has been churning out and only supplying, I don't know, five percent of their goods to the UK, you could lose it by just you know, wouldn't necessarily affect somebody manufacturing in in, in Italy or Austria. They could you know, find that those customers elsewhere. Yeah. But there's, there's other side of the equation, the UK exporters. I mean, roughly 56% of SMEs in the countries have a major market as Europe. Mm. And quite a proportion of them are um, in serious trouble relative to whether they can sustain the market with all the changes going on. Um, I mean, one thing that people don't seem to realise, you're now dealing with 23 different countries. And therefore, you know, you need the documentation to get across the border you cannot go from state to state in the way you could before um it's causing significant disruption and many of them are looking at potentially going out of business oh right. i mean that didn't occur to me that so if you if you sell sell if you ship goods into france there's for france then you or, or you must have already described that they're going to germany and just use france as a transit route you can't ship into france and then you know no. move it on to you germany or poland Location laid down as to what you're going to do and you are limited to the number of states that your transit system can go to. It's like the the flight the flights the flights can now only go from point to point. Mm. So again, if you're sending if you're sending goods by um, by air and they have to go to two different areas, two different states, um, you've got to send two flights. The flight would not take them from yeah, where. Yeah, what, what Roger's touched upon there is, as people are learning, but it seems everyone, unless you've got the money to do that learning straight away, a lot of people are standing still, as we've said, just to try and see if it does wash out a little bit or, or gets further further simplified to a degree. Because dealing with that, as Roger's, Roger's highlighted, is very challenging for any business. Yeah, mm. yeah. And there, are, I mean, yeah, I mean, I looked at, and I guess there's just not enough expertise around, is it? I mean, like you, you, that's the shortage of people who actually know what they're they're, they're really talking around. And uh, I mean, I've been watching the um, 
well, I've actually bid for myself Brexit consulting work, and uh, I'm certainly no expert in it. Um, and I'm pretty sh- pretty sure that the people even you know, with less knowledge than me have actually won some of those contracts to do Brexit consulting to SMEs. And uh, it's worrying, you know, all they're doing really is signposting to other government websites, and you can get up into a bit of a bit of a a loop which basically is, you know you get somebody advising you to go to this website and that says to go to this website and you don't actually have any you never get the to the answer to the actual question that you want to ask you know that's the uh, I, I don't think the i don't think a lot of the work has been done to help smes to understand how to trade with europe now mm. uh, i think there are too many open questions um and unfortunately that's the situation at the moment and of course, the service industry. Well, it's still in the air. No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. yeah uh, I think the the, the government advisors or, or the government. I'm I'm not going to put my um, put my two cents in it. We'll, we'll say we, we put adverts on the radio saying prepare for Brexit, which is all well and good. But unless you've actually got you know something if you've gone through the process or seen what's actually going to happen on a day-to-day basis, it doesn't really help you regardless of what the, um, the, the radio tells us to do. No. Yeah. And what preparation could you have made when you did, you know, on the, you know, the two days before the end of the or day before Christmas or whenever it was Christmas Eve, they announce it and well, sod all you can do at that stage. You've got either goods in transit already coming in or you've, uh, yeah. Anyway. Unfortunately, it, and it is strange to some extent, companies are still using the wrong documentation for customs clearance. Uh, they don't seem to, and it's very strange, it, it has changed. It's now the international type of documentation that you need. Whereas the, the simple EU documents disclosure previously was fine. And point of origin is a major issue in terms of being able to sell you, sell you goods and identify where they've come from. Yeah. I think the, the best example one has is of um, Marks and Spencers with their Percy Pig um, desserts or, or sweets that they try to sell, re-export to Ireland. They come in from Germany and they're not allowed to export them to Northern Ireland because that's now a barrier between here and the EU. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, And it's a detail. And you'd think, actually, that the EU would like that. I mean, I don't think they would have designed a process which would stop you buying in Germany and selling to another, you know, you know that's, um, that is clearly something that they would probably want. But uh, but then you can imagine, like, the problems, like, you know, if you, oh, I don't know, it's, uh, you could go on, couldn't you? So, yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a Brexit forum at 12 o'clock, so we'll go on from there. <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe I'll join you. So, um, right, well, I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining.